So I am taking over from Mine as the moderator for the afternoon session. Uh, my name is Vasna Ramasa, also from Lund University. As I mentioned earlier, I am not a migration scholar, but having lived now in seven countries in my adult life, I have certainly been the immigrant. In some contexts, I've been the foreigner. I guess, Thomas, maybe I've been the barbarian. Um, Surprisingly, even though I've worked for international organizations, never managed to be the expat. So, interesting dynamics to all of that. And that leads me to sort of where we're going with the afternoon. In the morning, we've had excellent presentations about the spaces of social transformation. And we're now moving into a session where we're going to be talking about the narratives of social transformation, focusing on climate change and borders as well. So to start us off, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Emer Emeritus uh, Betsy Hartman. Betsy was, is the Professor Emeritus of Development Studies at Hampshire College in the US. Um, she has worked on several interesting and integrated topics, population, migration, environment, security issues, a very interdisciplinary researcher, if I might say. Um, Betsy has also been the author of several books, including ones on reproductive rights and wrongs, A Quiet Violence, View from a Bangladesh Village, and most recently a book on apocalyptic thinking in the US. She's also told me that she's written several no novels, which I'm actually more interested to find out about later. For now, though, Betsy will be talking to us about old stereotypes and new normals, population, migration, and climate apocalypse. Thank you, Betsy. Well, thank you so much um, uh, to Mine Islar, David Harnisk, everyone at the Pufendorf Institute, and Vasna for the introduction. And I feel really honored to be here today. It's amazing to be in a space where people can brainstorm creatively, um, think politically, come together this way. Well, today I'm speaking and we're holding this conference at a critical confluence um, of the challenges posed by climate change, migration, militarism, and rising xenophobia as a political strategy of right-wing populist and neo-fascist movements. This is all taking place against a background of extreme wealth concentration, or I should say foreground of extreme wealth concentration in the hands of the proverbial 1%. Now, this confluence can be understood, misunderstood, or manipulated in many ways. My talk today will focus on the role of apocalyptic narratives and population discourses in the production of so-called climate conflict and climate refugees as dangerous security threats. Now, let me make it clear from the outset that in no way do I want to minimize the serious effects of climate change and the absolute urgency of finding ways to mitigate and respond to it. But its representation in apocalyptic terms is problematic on multiple counts. Take, for example, the IPCC's recent special report, which lays out the benefits and policy pathways of keeping temperature rise within 1.5 degrees Celsius. It's a sober and important report, but not an alarmist and apocalyptic one. In the US, however, the press hyped it as a forecast of almost certain doom. Whoops. Um, almost certain doom, turning this message, the, the can-do message of the report, into a dystopian cri de corps. This is um, nothing new, unfortunately. Apocalyptic thinking is as American as apple pie and a cornerstone of American empire and exceptionalism, a phenomenon I examine in depth in my book, The America Syndrome, Apocalypse War and Our Call to Greatness. In a highly militarized country, the United States, where I come from, where a staggering percentage of people believe the world will end in a battle of Armageddon, really, there are polls and, you know, maybe 30, 40% people think the world will end this way, 
War comes to seem necessary and inevitable. Part of God's grand design or of the more secular but equally determinist march of history to an American beat. Across the political spectrum, and I include the left here as well as the right, Americans are more predisposed to imagine the end of the world than the end of American war making. This profoundly affects our cultural imagination of climate change as propelling us into the end times where both people and nature will suffer horrific violence like this. The 2016 documentary Age of Consequences which showed in environmental film festivals across the country, begins with images of the atomic bomb, warning viewers that climate change could finish us off in a similar way. Now, ironically, or maybe understandably, predictably, the main villains fomenting violence in these doomsday dramas are poor people of color from the global south, not rich fossil fuel industry executives or their political cronies. Climate apocalypse serves as a sort of anti-political economy and anti-political ecology machine, obscuring issues of wealth, power, privilege, and responsibility. Helping to fuel this machine are notions of so-called climate conflict and climate refugees. By 2007, the idea that these pose a substantial security threat had spread in both international policy circles and popular media. The conflict in Darfur, Sudan, for example, was depicted as the harbinger of the coming era of climate wars, with violence there attributed to the interaction of climate change, population pressures, pressures and resource scarcity. The British NGO Christian Aid released a report called Human Tide, the real migration crisis at the same time, that warned of millions of climate refugees roaming the globe, wreaking havoc and creating, quote, a world of many more Darfurs. Soon in national security circles, especially in the US and Western Europe, climate change came to be seen as an important threat multiplier that could help trigger widespread political instability in poor regions, especially in Africa. And this language very much remains with us if you read international documents and military documents from NATO and the United States. Now, many researchers have challenged these claims. In a chapter on human security, the IPCC's 2014 Fifth Assessment Report concluded that most scholarly studies of the Darfur conflict found government practices to be far more influential drivers than climate variability. Moreover, the assumption that poor people will automatically resort to violence in periods of resource scarcity neglects the fact that in many cases the opposite is true and that scarcity can induce greater cooperation in innovation. Now that understanding of scarcity is usually used, you know, for Western entrepreneurs, right? But the idea that poor people might actually be able to innovate and cooperate is um, not taken into account. Another problem with seeing poor people as the main instigators of climate conflict is that it takes the focus away from the role of more powerful actors in fomenting climate-related violence. For example, through displacement of local communities in green grabs or coercive climate adaptation schemes that we're seeing more of. The notion of climate refugees also has serious flaws, as does the cover of this documentary. But that the effects of climate change, from sea level rise to severe storms to droughts and floods, may force or induce people to migrate temporarily or permanently is not in question. However, most serious migration researchers do not use the term climate refugee, preferring more accurate descriptors like climate-related migration. At this point, no one can predict the precise extent to which climate change will force migration, and with a possible exception of sea level rise, migration is too complex a process to label as simply climate-induced. Moreover, most researchers agree 
Climate-related displacement and migration are likely to happen mainly within national borders, not across them. And I think here we also see, like, there's a lot of really good scholarship about this um, and taking apart some of these narratives, but they might get a paragraph or two in the IPCC report, but in terms of the public consciousness, they're not brought forward. And I think that's always a problem with critical scholarship. Yet despite the volume of critical evidence to the contrary, claims that climate change is going to set poor people against each other and push them en masse toward US and European borders are as powerful as ever, occupying a prominent place in the apocalyptic political imagination of Western publics and policy makers. Today, Syria has replaced Darfur as the new locus of climate war. Setting the process in motion was an article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the US in March 2015. The authors argue that the drought that afflicted Syria from 2007 to 2010 was made two to three times more likely by human-induced climate change. They then asserted that the drought caused a max, mass exodus of peasants from rural to overcrowded, overpopulated urban areas, and that these migrants helped to tri trigger the civil war. The article, I watched in horror as this happened, spurred stories in major news outlets that climate change is an important cause of the Syrian war. People displaced by the conflict, almost 8 million within the country and 5 million outside, were then depicted in the press as climate refugees. As the refugee crisis in Europe worsened over the summer and fall of 2015, by the end of the year, a million people had arrived by boat, so did the climate refugee hyperbole. How Climate Change is Behind the Surge of Migrants to Europe was the title of a September Time magazine article. That same month, the Canadian National Observer carried the iconic photograph of a drowned Syrian boy on a Turkish beach with the headline, this is what a climate refugee looks like. Former US President uh, Bar Barack Obama and Secretary of State John Kerry and even Bernie Sanders, our venerable Bernie Sanders, added their voices to this choir. A recent study by climate scholars and regional experts, which of course has not got the publicity that this original article got, carefully assesses the evidence behind the Syria as climate conflict thesis and finds it seriously lacking. For one, meteorological data do not support the finding that the drought was due to climate change. Secondly, drought-related migration was nowhere near the scale claimed by the um, PNAS article and others like it. The statistic that 1.5 to 2 million Syrians migrated as a result of drought is based on one humanitarian news report and does not align with much lower estimates by UN and Syrian government agencies. Moreover, it wasn't just the drought per se that induced migration from rural areas. Other factors like the government's decision to reduce agricultural subsidies must be taken into account. Thirdly, field research among migrants who did leave because of drought has found little evidence of their participation in the 2011 political protests against the Assad regime that triggered the civil war. What is perhaps most worrying about the Syria climate conflict thesis is the way it depoliticizes and naturalizes the mass migration of war refugees, making it seem like a new normal. Rather than acknowledging that the current crisis is politically rooted, time-specific, and deeply geopolitical in nature, the message is that climate change will likely cause a state of permanent emergency in which nations should retreat from their commitments to provide asylum to refugees and instead fortify their borders and increase surveillance. Today, there are even attempts to spin the Central American caravan approaching the U.S. border as climate refugees, diverting attention from the central role of the U.S. support of the right-wing regime in Honduras, the disastrous drug war that has been launched with U.S. help, and the environmental destruction in uh, Honduras and other places in Central America perpetrated by extractive industries. 
Interestingly, the articles of this Guardian article uh, um, cite approvingly the statistic there will be 150 to 300 million climate refugees by 2050. Using as a reference, I actually clicked, you know, on the little link, an academic article that disputes such figures. So uh, when you go through and look at what they're basing their analysis on, they're actually, um, it's either shoddy journalism or they're lying because, you know, this article that they link to says, you know, you can't quantify, it's very difficult, these figures are problematic. So the widespread acceptance of these narratives is due in part to the way they draw on racialized and gendered Malthusian models and stereotypes, which unfortunately have the status of conventional wisdom in many quarters. I keep searching, I've been working on Malthusian ideology and population control policies for most of my career. I keep searching for the right metaphor. One friend of mine said they're like rhizomes that grow underground and you rip some up and it just keeps coming back up, you know? Um, I also uh, sometimes use the metaphor of ideological glue, that Malthusianism is a sort of ideological glue that binds liberals and conservatives together and also sometimes left and right. And that we have to be extremely attentive to how that happens. For example, concepts of caring capacity, tragedy of the commons, and limits to growth posit an inexorable, str inexorable struggle between population growth and scarce resources. In so doing, they naturalize inequalities in wealth and power, largely ignore possibilities for positive social, economic, and technological transformation, including cooperative management of the commons, and often misread or misrepresent demographic data. The aggregation of all human beings into one big bad lump disguises the fact that the overpopulation of most concern is of poor people of color. In the case of migrants, these concepts of limits too easily transmute into actual borders. I believe we need to think very hard right now about how current theories of the Anthropocene and planetary boundaries, which has um, its uh, you know, foundation here in Sweden, are beset with similar problems. The idea that reducing population growth is a good, if not the best, way to mitigate climate change is now gaining traction in many quarters. Neil Malthusian degradation narratives more directly undergird discourses of climate refugees and climate conflict. Taking off in the 1970s development field, but with deeper roots in colonial policy, these narratives warn that in rural parts of the global south, population pressure coupled with poverty is the main cause of land deg de degradation and resource scarcity. Once poor people deplete their immediate environments, the reasoning goes, they then migrate to other marginal lands, setting in motion the same vicious downward spiral which often culminates in ethnic violence. In the 1990s, the concept of environmental security took the degradation narrative one giant step further. After wreaking havoc in rural areas, the story continues, these migrants move to the cities where they contribute to youth bulges of unemployed, angry young men who are prone to political extremism and terrorism. As such, they pose a major threat to national and international security. Malthusianism remains so powerful, I argue, because it not only naturalizes, it pathologizes and biologizes the latter often along gender lines. Twinned with the angry black and brown young men of the youth bulge are pregnant black and brown young women whose fertility must be controlled to save the planet as well as to better harness their labor in the neoliberal marketplace. Now, please don't get me wrong. I am a strong supporter of sexual and reproductive health and rights, including universal access to contraception and abortion. I've spent my career fighting for those rights and for the rights to health care. But the way young women's fertility is instrumentalized in present population, environment, and climate discourses is problematic indeed.
As the saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words, and even more than the numbers and narratives, the visual imagery of overpopulation reinforces deep-seated Western prejudices about race, gender, class, and ethnicity. Take the 2015 coffee table book, Overdevelopment, Overpopulation, Overshoot, lavishly produced by the Foundation for Deep Ecology and the Population Media Center in the United States. The book's lurid photographs of dark-skinned crowds, these are people trying to get food during a disaster, I think, starving, um, and here's another picture, this is of China and a beach. So they're, they're um, lurid photographs of crowds and saying these crowds are due to overpopulation. Further pictures of starving African children in a refugee camp, um, and pregnant bellies rob people of their identity and dignity. That such images are deemed acceptable, the images were in fact featured in major media outlets, including The Guardian, attest to how deeply racism, like a major river, carves and shapes the population landscape. And I'd just like to um, make a comment here. I'm reading uh, Irene Wilkerson's books, The Warmth of Other Suns, about the great migration of um, black people from Jim Crow South to northern cities and midwestern cities and California um, during the last century. And so many of the narratives that when, when poor rural people migrated into the cities, the same kind of pathologization narratives about that black migration movement kind of have, you can hear echoes of that in these um, kind of security, uh, degradation narrative and uh, international security narratives around um, climate change, migration, population. Um, so, it, especially in the case of the U.S., domestic racism is never far behind when you're investigating how these discourses work. And I suppose that is true in many countries. Policy documents, are not immune, are hardly immune, from these influences, as illustrated by this UK government report on population and sustainability. And you can he see here, it makes an explicit visual link to the migration to Europe of young African men. Inside, other young men of color brandish weapons in the so-called youth bulge. And I think it's important to note here, sometimes you'll have a report like this, probably the inside language is kind of dry, but the visual imagery is deeply racist and problematic. If you want to see how all these narratives and images um, are woven together in one place, watch the documentary Age of Consequences, which I mentioned before, which is a love song not only to the apocalypse, but to our purported saviors, the US military. I forced myself to watch it before I came to this uh, meeting. I've been putting it off for two years, but it's really horrible. Um, and it's designed for liberal audiences, um, and I think people should be aware of that. So in the era of climate change, the toxic brew of apocalyptic thinking and Malthusian ideology convinces many otherwise well-meaning people that it is morally justified to curtail the human rights of poor people and migrants in order to protect ourselves and the planet from otherwise certain doom. In other words, it creates a receptive audience. Yet the question remains, who exactly is directing and staging the play? A variety of powerful actors and institutions strategically deploy these fear-based narratives and images to garner support for their respective agendas, some with like good intentions. The list includes population agencies jumping on the climate change bandwagon in the hope that they can secure more funds for international family planning. Many environmentalists portray climate change as a national security threat to get greater attention paid to climate change at the highest levels of government kind of a securitization. In the US, where climate denialists and the fossil fuel industry exercise inordinate power over the state, this temptation to play the fear card is understandable, but it's not advisable. Forecasting doom is also profitable, and I think we have to realize this too, and environmental pundits, journalists, and think tanks know well that there's money to be made and media attention to be garnered by promoting worst case scenarios. The response to the latest IPCC report is a case in point. <laughs> 
For their part, U.S. and NATO defense interests deploy the threat of climate conflict and climate refugees to legitimize further military expansion into Africa, expand their control over disaster assistance, I think this is very important to take note of, and beef up border enforcement in the process providing lucrative contracts to defense, border, and surveillance industry. There are several books that kind of detail this kind of growing uh, border, military, industrial, prison complex. Defining climate change as a security threat also meshes well with a shift in U.S. defense policy toward a greater focus on counterinsurgency and stability operations such as local policing and aid delivery. Now, since U.S. President Donald Trump is aligned with climate change deniers, it is unclear whether US, official U.S. defense policy will continue to assert the link between climate change, scarcity, and violent conflict. Testifying before a Senate panel in early 2017, Secretary of Defense James Mattis did affirm the link. Whatever the case, one can anticipate that Trump's denialism will push environmental actors to play the national security card in a sort of desperate counter move to keep climate change on the policy agenda. At the same time, Trump's alliance with the anti-abortion movement means that the population lobby may feel compelled to raise alarm about supposed demographic threats like the youth bulge to build support for international family planning assistance as a smart form of counterterrorism. Now, with the political ascendancy of the right wing, of right wing population, populism, sorry, with the political ascendancy of right wing populism in the US, Europe, and across the globe, we need to pay special attention to how white supremacist, nativist, and neo fascist movements can exploit such environmental fears in their interest. I first encountered this phenomena, which I've called the greening of hate, when I was invited to debate a woman named Virginia Abernethy at an environmental law conference in Oregon in 1994. Abernethy, then a professor at Vanderbilt University, was representing an organization called the Caring Capacity Network. The topic of our debate was supposed to be women and population stabilization, but I soon realized I wasn't debating a fellow environmentalist environmentalist or family planning advocate, but instead an anti-immigrant zealot for whom population control and carrying capacity meant circling our wagons and closing our borders. Interestingly, she also said, you know, to empower women, you, you know, to, to employ them, you don't really need to empower them through education. You could like just chain people to sewing machines. Anyway, I knew then that <laughs> something else was going on here, yet she was, uh, t you know, she was promoted at that conference as a spokesperson or spokeswoman for women and the environment. I later learned, um, in fact, I got so worried about what I witnessed and some of the other people that came along with her to that conference that um, I worked with others to kind of expose their right-wing ties, and I learned that she worked with the White Supremacist Council of Conservative Citizens. And in 2011, Abernathy joined the neo-fascist American Third Position, now renamed the American Freedom Party, the largest white nationalist political party now operating in the United States. In the person of Abernathy, I encountered a well-funded nativist network founded by Michigan eye doctor and neo-eugenicist John Tanton that cloaks itself in green language to lure liberal environmentalists into its conservative fold. They, in fact, tried to take over the Sierra Club in the United States. Fortunately, activists turned um, them back. Its main contention is that immigration by spurring U.S. population growth drives environmental degradation. When they come to the U.S., the argument goes, immigrants cause everything from traffic congestion to deforestation to accelerated greenhouse gas emissions, to name a few. This environmental burden compounds the supposed economic burden they play on taxpayers, schools, hospitals, and other public services. Key members of the Tanton Network occupy, or used to occupy, prominent positions within the Trump administration. These include former Attorney General Jeff Sessions and his acolyte Stephen Miller, who is now a senior advisor to Trump and one of the chief architects of uh, the president's immigration policy. They're both involved in an organization called Numbers USA um, as part of this um, uh, Tanton Network.
In Italy, the Five Star Movement trumpets green concerns at the same time that it attacks immigrants in alliance with the far-right Lega, a, a coalition forged with the blessing of the alt-right Goebbels Gerb wannabe Steve Bannon, who has left the United States to work his wonders here in Europe. Racial and ethnic purity is central to the romantic ideal of a pristine nature and nation many far-right environmentalists espouse. Writing about the menace of eco-fascism in the New York Review of Books, Matthew Phelan issues this important warning. I think it's worth quoting here. The survival of these tendencies within environmentalism could be potentially more menacing than the survival of fascist tendencies against environmentalism. For most of our lives, we've lived with a persistent threat of extreme right movements backed by capital invested in historical dead ends such as fossil fuels and the freedom to pollute. But far right movements backed by new sectors of the economy could threaten to be something far worse. They could be sustainable. So the stakes are high, extremely high, um, showing this picture of um, children being caged uh, in the family separation um, uh, that happened at the border not so long ago. And um, I believe some, of, some actually outrage about this family separation may have influenced the midterm elections, but maybe not the Democratic Party, but... but popular opinion, as it was so terrible, and it remains so terrible. Um, and just to mention here, too, that, you know, the U.S. has a long history of family separation of Native Americans and of black families um, through foster care system. And in a way, it's drawing on that history of family separation to attack also women and children and the whole notion of family and reproduction and social reproduction um, that you know, you see in this photo and is still continuing and many children still have yet to be reunited with their parents. Now, I believe resistance is necessary, but it's not sufficient. We need competing and compelling non-apocalyptic and non-militaristic visions of economic and environmental justice, human rights, and human movements in the era of climate change, and as people have been talking about here, new forms of solidarity. Um, so I would urge, and I think those are happening, but they need to be, if, you know, if there's one thing scholars and academics can do is really to try to come up with some of those visions um, and work with other, you know, activist folks and communities to come up with those visions that are compelling and that can mobilize people. So, um, and in this era of climate change, I would also urge people to resist the easy kind of categories of climate refugees or climate wars. I mean, so many of my friends really bought the Syria story, for example, I was just shocked you know, um, and uh, you know, a lot of people watch that movie, The Age of Consequences, and we're convinced. So it's really important, I think, not just to work against the right, but also with your own friends and family and colleagues to try to, um, to challenge these visions and find ones that are um, progressive and uh, move us on to a, a, a new point in time. So thank you very much and welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Betsy. So, we actually have a fair bit of time, about 20 minutes, to take questions and discussion with Betsy. Um, so I'd like to open it up to the audience, if anyone has any questions. Uh, I have a list here, but I'm going to hold back for a bit. <laughs> Great, thank you very much then. So... <laughs> oh, he has a question. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to pass you the microphone. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think this is a very uh, important treatise um, that needs to be out there and conveyed. And because there, there is a counter-narrative, <clears throat> and the counter-narrative is that um, migration in the light of change or in the face of change is an adaptation strategy which is as old as humankind right. and therefore migration as adaptation is something that needs to be embraced 
and, and support it. So, so how would you like to frame this? What would be your sort of presentation from that perspective? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. I know, you know, there, there was a climate um, a report by, um, uh, I think, scholars in, in Norway and elsewhere uh, about uh, eight years ago or so that talked about, actually, if you couldn't migrate during a climate-related event, it was much worse than if you could migrate, right? So I think, you know, one thing is to, yes, look at the various ways migration is involved in adaptation. Um, uh, and different kinds of migration, you know, temporary, permanent, um, across international borders, within countries, how that migration takes place. Also to look at how, um, you know, I know critical work has been done here on resilience, right? And resilience is a problematic framework, but how do you make infrastructure, infrastructure more resilient in an era of climate change so that people, don't necessarily have to move, or if they do move, they have they have the ability to come back um, if they want to. Um, so, and again, the extent of migration will also depend on the on the extent uh, that infrastructure um, uh, is made, um, you know, uh, more resilient to uh, climate related challenges. You know, so. Those are some things um, that I would say. And the other, I think, important thing, and I, the climate-related uh, migration researchers really point this out, the decision to migrate and the decision how and where to migrate depends so much on kind of networks, like you, you know, that, of relatives, of friends, of job opportunities. And so, you know, to argue that it's climate change that's forcing you to migrate, um, well, you know, it could be climate-related, but where you, your ability to migrate and how you migrate is so much dependent on your history, on your class position, on you know where it's safe to go. So those things remain uh, extremely important. The other thing I would just raise here is you know the kind of natural disasters. So uh, you know in this time of natural disasters, which seem to be rising in the era of climate change, how. Um, migration is dealt with in those instances? Is it, uh, you know, and is it policed and patrolled like it is being now, or is it accepted? Um, and, um, you know, those kinds of issues really remain important too, and become increasingly important too, I think. Um, I'd like to just pick up on something you said, and relating to Stephen's talk earlier, where he mentioned that you know one of the factors influencing migration is media portrayals of the global north, and you sort of intimated that a lot of the problem also lies with the single story we have about the global south yeah. and, and migration. And of course, that we need to think about the complexity of factors and, and drivers and, and responses as well how do we navigate between sort of a single story and so much complexity, but we still want to communicate to a public audience? Right, <laughs> you hit upon the big problem, right? I mean, how do you translate complex um, phenomena into simpler messages, yeah. but not simplistic messages? Exactly. Well, I mean, I think storytelling, um, it's not the only answer, but I think when you have people's stories about their migration and why they migrated, it can be very powerful and, and deepen people's understanding because they mm -hmm. see in, in one person's story, they see the complexity mm -hmm. of a person's life and their choices, right, or, the, or their lack of choices. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that's extremely important. I, th I do believe, I think there's a real silence um, on the racism of some of these narratives um, and, uh, uh, and images, and th those have to be called out mm. um, also. And I think, why are these simple, simplistic and problematic narratives still so powerful? I mean, I've, you know, there's a lot of great critical literature about, you know, the, the degradation narrative and why it's really, um, you know, deeply rooted in colonial policy and settlement agriculture and, um, you know, and the stories about herders. I mean, there's such a, a wide literature about that. So how do we summon up also some of that wonderful field work mm -hmm. and field research? How do we then translate it? 
I think one place one can work too is with NGOs um, who I too often rely on kind of histrionic hyperbole about, mm -hmm. um, right, and use some of these same narratives in order to shock people into giving money or to get media coverage. And I think we need to maybe work with, call out, um, talk to, uh, convince them not to do so, um, and that that's extremely important too. Mm. Yeah, there's the you know sort of discussion about what is the development pornography, the yes. seeing the starving child in yes. Africa and and using and manipulating that. Yeah. Yes. Martin, you had a question. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Betsy. I thoroughly enjoyed your your talk. I could ask many questions. Uh, right now, I'll settle for one, which is uh, Andrew Baldwin has coined the term future conditional mm. about uh, the climate migrant. Even he acknowledges it's a, what is that figure yeah. actually? Well, the way it's talked about is in the future as a conditional. Mm. If this and this, then this and this. Mm. So I'm just testing out this concept with <laughs> your framework because it seems to me you're, we can define this future conditional disastrous figure as an always looming catastrophe which can never be laid to rest and is used to justify more and more pervasive securitization and control. So it's a win-win it's a in terms of the sustainable uh, fascism you talk yeah. of. Or, or would you agree with, with this idea? Yes, definitely. And also, I'm really curious how, you know, the military comes up with worst case scenarios, right? I mean, I suppose it's part of their business, like they have a whole series of scenarios, right? But they're the worst case ones. And you know, the Pentagon in 2003 did this worst case scenario on climate change where, oh my God, you know, all those starving people from the Caribbean and Central America were gonna come knocking at our borders and they were gonna be, you know, things were only gonna get better when there was massive die-offs of people and carrying capacity came back. So, I mean, that was even viewed is kind of alarmist by people in the military. But what has been really worrying for me is to see how these wor this kind of worst case scenario coming out of the military, um, you know, even in work of progressive climate people, like uh, I was reading, um, you know, a book, the book by Naomi Klein, also um, uh, a Parenti's book on Tropic of Chaos, and you'll sometimes find and that uh, authors like them will use these worst case scenarios coming out of the military to kind of promote the idea that this is really an urgent crisis that we need to have to deal with. So their intentions are good, right? But they employ the word, you know, they're, and they will cite sometimes, the military is cited as an accurate source. And it's the worst case scenarios of the military that are cited as a, you know, as a source. So I think we need to also follow the construction of knowledge around this. I mean, I think that's absolutely true about the future conditional, but how is that actually being, um, you know, sourced and resourced and used even by liberals and leftists? Um, and what does that say? Um, I don't know if that's the same case in Europe, but certainly in the United States. Can I then follow up on that? Because you said uh, something about who is directing and staging the play mm -hmm. and, you know, mentioned the roles of states and, and military and so forth. And it then leads to the question as a follow up to this is researchers, academics, scholarly work. Where and how are we, sometimes with good intentions yeah. uh, and naively, but sometimes with a, a particular agenda, are also directing and staging that play? And mm. how do you see that landscape in terms of where research is going uh, related to this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's some really good research going on, but more needs to be done. But, uh, you know, when I... Uh, this is perhaps a terrible thing to say, but I do see the r role of ego and promotion in some of this too, that even among some researchers, so that if you, com you know, if you comply with the apocalyptic vision, you're probably gonna get on TV much more easily than if you come on mm -hmm. TV saying it's complex, it's climate related migration, it's not climate refugees, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think we, ha we as scholars also need to guard against that tendency to grab attention um, through such narratives, yeah? Mm -hmm. Hmm. 
and maybe to raise up to the good work being done by graduate students, by, you know, by other academics, that showing how complex this is and, and I suppose here, too, would be an argument for cross-disciplinarity. Absolutely. Uh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> interdisciplinary. And, yeah, interdisciplinary. <laughs> and certainly, um, you know, the, the article that critiqued the Syria's climate war, um, I know that uh, international relations scholar, a climate geographer, a, um, a migration um, a specialist from the region, a um, actually a colleague of mine at Hampshire College, an economist, Syrian economist, they came together to write that in an interdisciplinary way, and I think mm. present very, um, you know, it's a very good case. Yeah. Any other reflections or questions from the audience? Well, I do, <laughs> <laughs> if I may. Yes. Uh, so back to the great migration. Um, this is a, a pet, my, it's my own research. So I'm, I'm a little bit egoistic, uh, egotistical ask, asking about it. Yeah. But um, W.E. Dubois wrote about the great migration from the former Jim Crow and North and uh, the kind of apocalyptic future conditionals that this migration was described with is very interesting to revisit yeah. because he was asking too, what's the cause of this? There are some climat climatic e events he's talking about uh -huh. as well. Okay. But, uh, but if you trace them further back, you see that they are very reminiscent of the um, same discourses that you see all over the sugar islands, the sugar colonies, yeah. uh, which is demographic arguments of, of tides and, and overwhelming, uh, uh, a weakened white minority facing, uh, but also importing uh, a massive uh, black majority, etc. So, so wouldn't you also trace it further back than the, the Great Migration to, to the, the plantation you know, machinery? Slavery, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah certainly, yeah. Um, and in fact, you know, reading this book, The Warmth of Other Suns, is, I mean, for, you know, I've studied some of that history, but not much, and it made me realize how much, you know, post-Reconstruction, a form of enslavement it persisted in the South, you know, um, that many people aren't even aware of. So it's, um, yeah. And that, that was a force to migrate. I mean, a direct force to migrate was to escape the violence of Jim Crow in the South, yeah. I'd like to come to sort of the, the final points you made about, you know, visions of, of justice mm. and, and new forms of solidarity. And uh, going back to the point Vanessa made about these different frames uh, as we talk to each other, one of the things that we've seen quite commonly in the climate justice movement is the sometimes the wish to, to really just assert the climate change agenda over everything else. So even, you know, there's been instances with, um, you know, the stand against, uh, standing rock against the Keystone Pipeline and the North Dakota uh, struggles where people have asserted, Native Americans have asserted, this is not just about climate change. You know, ours is a struggle that is much older, much longer. Um, do you see that happening as well in activism and movements where there is again this use of climate refugee narrative mm. as a way to subsume all issues into the climate change agenda okay. uh, beyond just academia and the media but also amongst activists. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think Standing Rock was really important in that, you know, the leaders really spoke out about that. Um, also, uh, there was, and I think it helped radicalize a lot of young activists, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, into a more uh, longer historical yeah. um, understanding, uh, and it was also about water resources, right? Um, also, you know, I don't know if you read that uh, a group of veterans came to mm -hmm. defend the camp, so that was quite amazing also. Um, so I, there, it's hopeful. Uh, there's also been some talk that apocalyptic messaging doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. um, within the climate movement. I think people are starting to talk about that more um, that because it often renders people fatalistic for one thing. Uh, what can we do? And um, so, I mean, I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but there's also, you know, there's certain divides too between, 
Um, for example, if you want to implement carbon taxes or some kind of more progressive form of um, carbon pricing, um, how can you convince sometimes radical activists that such a kind of technocratic, you know, apparently technocratic, but it could be a redistributional policy is also a good thing? So I don't know how we bring everyone together on this, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a hard one. Again, another yeah. one of those big challenges that yeah. we have. Yes. Yeah? Good. Okay. If there are no other questions from the audience, if we can say thank you very much to Betsy again. Thank, thank you.